10 years ago, $25 million in seed money launched a new organization called Autism Speaks. On its first web page, co-founder Suzanne Wright described their physician telling them the words they feared most. Their two-year-old grandson, Christian, had autism. That same year, author Paul <coughs> Collins wrote a memoir called Not Even Wrong about his two-year-old son, Morgan. He described how Morgan Collins could read, spell, perform multiplication tables in his head, but he could not even answer to his own name. Autism Speaks portrayed Christian, a child lost. At the same time, Collins portrayed Morgan as a child with a gift and asked his readers, what is normal? Today, 10 years later, we revisit the two competing theories one promoted by hundreds of millions of dollars funneled through Autism Speaks, and the other supported by ill-funded group of alternative thinkers and people who are, to use their hashtag, actually autistic. This is the Autism Channel World News for Monday, March 2nd, 2015. I'm Nancy Quinones. Last Wednesday, Autism Speaks launched a major marketing effort to celebrate their 10-year anniversary. Good Morning America on the U.S. network ABC aired a piece that once again told Christian Wright's story, the story of the grandchild of the founders, who was described on that first website as a child whose mind and spirit had been kidnapped in a process that was heartbreaking and incredibly painful to watch. When Good Morning America introduced the piece, the anchor highlighted Autism Speaks quest to find a cure. Big anniversary in the battle against autism. Autism Speaks is marking 10 years of action to raise awareness and seek a cure for autism. And Nightline's Judy Chang spoke to its founders about all the progress they've made over the last decade. He hasn't spoken spontaneously in a long time. It haunts me sometimes because I remember it. 13-year-old Christian Wright lives in his own world, diagnosed with autism when he was just two. That's when his grandparents, Bob Wright, then chairman of NBC Universal, and his wife Suzanne launched Autism Speaks, dedicated to fighting all aspects of the disease. It's been a remarkable decade. Here, here we are, it's a moment of reflection, 10 years. What are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the fact that we did bring autism to the global vocabulary. Hello. Their daughter oh, Katie is Christian's mom. 10 years ago, it was awful. People didn't understand what autism was. Now, when things go bad or when he's loud or, you know, I just explain, like, he's autistic and people get it. For the rights, awareness has been key. 10,000 landmarks around the world, from the Sydney Opera House to the Eiffel Tower, lit up in blue for World Autism Awareness Day. Autism Speaks, fighting in Congress, in the courts. And Neurodiversity advocates point out that nowhere in the ABC report was the competing narrative of embracing neurodiversity. That same day, however, the Daily Beast ran a story about Autism Speaks that began by asking, in the very first paragraph, whether people on the spectrum want to be cured. In the last 10 years during which Autism Speaks merged with competing nonprofit Cure Autism Now, the neurodiversity movement has been growing louder. Carl Newbiel has that part of the story. Thank you, Nancy. The Daily Beast article was written by Elizabeth Picciuto a Ph.D. in philosophy who teaches at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She specializes in philosophy of the mind and aesthetics and is a regular contributor to the Daily Beast, often writing on issues of the disabled and bioethics. She packaged for popular culture what has been a raging debate among bioethicists for the 10 years Autism Speaks has been raising money for a cure. And she picked up a very early trend in what was about to happen to Autism Speaks in social media. As part of its celebration, the nonprofit asked Twitter users to tweet how Autism Speaks had touched their lives. They may not have been prepared for some of the answers they got. Francisco Urena will join us later with that part of the story. But right now, we're joined by Elizabeth Picciuto herself. 
Elizabeth, what's the answer here? Should we cure autism if we can? If we don't know, then how can we decide if we should or not? Uh, would that that question were so easy, and, um, and I don't think it is that easy. And if I, we listen to people with autism, the answer seems to be on the no side. Um, there certainly seem to be some symptoms that could be alleviated, but that is different from cure. Uh, so, for example, there are gastrointestinal uh, symptoms that are associated with autism and that make people with autism uncomfortable. Um, and uh, people would seem to be in agreement that, yes, that those could be alleviated. Um, but most people with autism would say, that's not autism, that's not me. However, when you talk about curing autism, you talk about changing the identities of people with autism. You're talking about snuffing out people with autism and replacing them with someone new. That's a pretty dramatic thing to say. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty it's a scary thing when you're talking about, it. first of all, curing people who are already alive. Um, and then when you talk about um, the fact that People with autism have something to offer us, uh, neurotypicals, uh, you know, that, it, that there's a range of ways of being. And if the rest of us can be a little bit more tolerant of things like hand flapping or uh, not making eye contact, we could be a little, open our minds a little bit more to some very creative ways of thinking and creative ways of being. The Daily Beast article touched on the underlying academic debate carried on in the scholarly journals, which took a big step forward on the 17th of last month when Chong Ming Lim weighed in on what was the then current prevailing theory, the proposal that we decide who gets accommodated and who gets cured on the basis of IQ scores which had been proposed by bioethicists Pierre Jarzma and Stellan Wellen. Chong Ming Lim found a lot of reasons why Jarzma and Wellen's idea might not work out well in practice. Mr. Lim is a research associate at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. He joins us now from Singapore. Mr. Lim, what's wrong with the Jarzma and Wellen plan to fix some and accommodate others? So, um, so there are several strands of arguments uh, in Jasma and Wellin. Um, the most notable of which is um, their attempt or their strategy to separate um, autistics in, uh, autistic individuals out for either accommodation or treatment or, or cure on the basis of their IQ scores. So, and, and here I'm roughly representing them. They, they want to say that um, there are those whom we call low-functioning autistics um, with very low IQ scores. And then there, on the other side of the spectrum, there are high-functioning autistics um, who have you know, reasonable IQ scores or high IQ scores. And so their claim is that we can separate um, autistic individuals out into two groups, um, one of which qualifies for accommodation and the other for treatment. Now, I, I think that there are um, three different strands of criticisms that can be made um, against this, this strategy of separating autistics out on the basis of IQ. Um, so the first is that there has been increasing um, disagreement about what exactly is being measured by um, IQ tests. So people are increasingly becoming uncertain about you know, what exactly these IQ test scores reflect, and, you know, whether or not they reflect um, intelligence more generally, uh, or whether or not they just represent a, a a very small subset uh, of intelligence in, or, or whether or not they correlate with how well people live in the world and navigate their surroundings and so on and so forth. And the second line of argument, can you tell us about that? Um, the second strand of criticism is um, uh, begins from you know, uh, you know some disagreements about how we ex actually um, measure intelligence. So. Michelle Dawson, uh, the scientist, and her colleagues have have uh, recently, uh, well, in 2007, um, argued that the most commonly used IQ test, the Wechsler Intelligence Scale, um, manages to sneak in some requirements for verbal competencies or for social effectiveness um, that autistic individuals don't fare very well at, um, and. 
because of this that um, autistic individuals will score lower on these tests and then be sort of unjustly taken as um, having low IQ or not very, very intelligent or being intellectually disabled. And what's your third and final line of argument? Now, the final one, um, which to my mind seems, you know, a very strong criticism, um, is begins from questioning the, the relevance of um, IQ to the whole debate at all. So the claim here is that, you know, IQ may not actually be really relevant to our decisions about, you know, whether or not we should treat autistics or we should, you know, um, we should accommodate them. Now, so this, this argument can be... Uh, maybe clarify a little bit by giving an analogy. So consider, you know, consider um, an intellectually disabled um, gay individual or in intellectually disabled gay citizen. Now, we wouldn't think that simply because he is um, intellectually disabled or he has a very low or non-existent IQ score, that therefore we can, you know, we can treat him for his homosexuality. Now, we don't think that. Now, for, for many of us at least, um, homosexuality comes across as a valuable human difference um, that is not to be cured or eradicated um, regardless of you know, the intellectual capacities of the person in concern. So for us, it, for, for, for many of us, it is, it is part of the diversity of forms that, that human beings can take uh, in this world. So I think, and this is, I, I believe, the point of analogy that a lot of uh, neurodiversity um, proponents want to point to. Uh, between their movement and the gay rights movement, which is that they're both seeking to normalize um, a, a, a salient feature of themselves. So being homosexual or being autistic, they're trying to reconceptualize that um, and trying to normalize that as part of um, a valuable sort of human diversity. So, so, so I think put together, these are the three strands of criticisms um, that I have uh, against Jasmas Jasma and Wellen's uh, uh, sort of strategy of separating autistics for treatment and, and accommodation. All right, thank you so much. Nancy? In the world of academia, it has been a very civil discussion, but on social media, it became a virtual bra. Francisco Urena joins us with the details after the break. This is the Autism Channel World News. I'm Nancy Quinones. Twenty years ago, corporations and nonprofits could, with enough money and manpower, control the narrative. But social media is changing that. Francisco Urena has more. A big part of marketing with social media is to get your followers and fans to do your work for you. You ask them to fill Twitter with tweets about you, and if you can get your hashtag trending on Twitter, you've hit the mother load. But there's always the possibility that your marketing plan will backfire. Autism Speaks' plan was to ask its supporters to tell the Twitterverse how Autism Speaks had touched their lives and to celebrate their anniversary by using the hashtag Autism Speaks 10 when they did it. But there's no way to limit the use of a hashtag to just your supporters. And if you've got vocal detractors with Twitter accounts, you've probably also got a big problem. It wasn't long before BuzzFeed pointed that problem out. And they did it when their site was doing record traffic because of their coverage of the dress. That got even more people in the mix. That appears to have attracted the attention of freelancer Robin Lempel, who writes for several websites. One of them is MTV.com. No one at MTV will talk with us about it, but we have confirmed that a story with her byline about the hijacking of the hashtag appeared on MTV.com, and it stayed up just long enough to get some praise from readers 
who complain their voices are usually not heard. And then it disappeared. But as I report this story, the hashtag war continues, fueled by some committed people on both sides. One of them is Alyssa Hillary, an autistic activist who joins us via Skype. Alyssa, you are one of a large group of actually autistic people who took Autism Speaks hashtag promotion in an entirely different direction from what Speaks intended. How did that happen? Well, they asked people to say how over the last 10 years, Autism Speaks had touched our lives. Many, many autistic adults have had our lives affected negatively by Autism Speaks. And if they're asking for our input, I mean, we answered the question. Just because they don't like our answer, I don't know how they don't know that we have this opinion because we've been telling them for all 10 years they've been around. I'm not sure how they didn't expect this. It is terrible planning on their part that they did not expect this, honestly. I'm Francisco Urena, somewhere in cyberspace. Autism Speaks, ABC, and Viacom were contacted for comment. As of this report, none has responded. It's Monday, and that means Barbara Sharp joins us with details of an event in the autism community and a story of a speech and learning center that's been around since long before autism was on most people's radar. Barbara? The Speech and Language Development Center serves students on the autism spectrum as well as those who have learning disabilities or speech and language disorders, among others. Their upcoming coaster run at one of Southern California's best amusement parks will raise money for school equipment and supplies, staff, and programs. Joining us today is Dan Griggs. And before you talk about your race, how about if you tell us a little bit about your school? Absolutely. Uh, the school started in uh, actually Aline Agranowitz's home in her living room and uh, Aline had been working with uh, veterans, uh, her adult aphasia uh, uh, group, and um, they started seeing uh, families and kids that had similar issues and this sort of evolved. She uh, teamed up with um, Gladys Gleason, who is a counselor and uh, also a nurse and uh, the school grew from there. Many families heard by word of mouth about uh, the work that they were doing, and um, through several locations, we ended up in the uh, current location that we're at uh, here in Buena Park. So what kind of programs do you offer now? You know, one of the things that makes our school unique it is it is a complete program. We offer all therapy, all needed services under one roof. So we're not only a K through 12 school, but we're also a therapy center that offers OT, PT, we have uh, speech therapy, we have uh, a neurofeedback offer, there is counseling here. So it's really a, a complete solution. So tell us, how do people participate in the Coaster Run? It's held at Knott's Berry Farm, which, which is a, a, a wonderful amusement park here in uh, Buena Park, California, where we're located. And uh, it benefits Speech and Language Development Center. Uh, and this is our 10th year. And it is a 5K, a 10K run. Uh, for those that don't want to run, uh, they can walk the 5K. We also have a kids run in Camp Snoopy that um, is a 1K and uh, it's very popular. Uh, we, we get over 5,000 participants. Uh, and as I said, this is our 10th year. So we're, we're looking forward to it on March 8th. Thank you so much for joining us. For more information on the Speech and Language Development Center Coaster Run in Buena Park, California, check out the information on your screen. That's the Autism Channel World News for Monday. For our news team and everyone at the Autism Channel, join us again as we continue to unlock the wonders of autism. See you next time. I'm Nancy Quinones.